Hello everyone, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel for yet another daily trade update. I am uh, continuing with these, I'll certainly do one for tomorrow, uh, maybe not do one over the weekend, but each and every day throughout this trade period I'm going to be doing my best to keep you up with all the news. This one is a, uh, I would say quieter one, there's no uh, actual deals that took place today, but we're going to provide an update on uh, you know a lot of the stuff that is bubbling away under the surface and perhaps that will give some insight as to what's going to happen Friday and then of course uh, when when the trade period resumes Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I forget exactly which day it ends. I think it's Wednesday night. But either way, if you want to stay up to date with all the latest trade news, uh, this is a good channel to subscribe to if you haven't already. Uh, in and around trade updates that I've been doing, I've also been doing some analytical pieces uh, here and there as well, and I'm going to continue that this weekend. There will still be content on the channel. So for all the trade news, make sure you subscribe. So today, after a, a pretty busy uh, Wednesday where a lot of deals got done, we saw a relatively quiet afternoon. Uh, quite a few stalemates happening as well, of which I'm going to provide an update. Uh, as a little aside before we crack into what's actually happening, an interesting little point I saw was that there's 12 players that have switched clubs this year. Nine of those 12, so 75%, were actually playing you know reserves this year at some point. So we're seeing a lot of fringe players moving clubs this year. And uh, the other three that move clubs that that were not considered fringe players would be uh, Ben Mackay, of course, joining Essendon, Taylor Adams to the Swans, and uh, Tom Dode also, who um, obviously did an ACL, but is a best 22 player at Adelaide. So we're seeing a lot of players move sort of around the fringes of their teams and uh, clubs trying to optimize their list, consolidate depth, particularly when it comes to talls. We do see a lot of pl uh, players move around to fill list spots as well, which doesn't mean it's not interesting, to be honest, because, uh, you know, arguably some of the biggest high profile deals that have happened in the, in the previous years. Um, it's not actually super common that they will help a team really push for a premiership. We've seen um, well, we've seen that sometimes it goes completely the opposite direction, but there are plenty of examples of, you know, role players coming into sides and helping them consolidate their best 22 and, you know, help for a premiership push or even a finals push. And you look at uh, Collingwood was the biggest example of this last year. They traded in four players. McStay was pretty high profile in a sense, but uh, still not a genuine A grader. But, you know, Bobby Hill went for a second rounder, I think. Certainly wasn't the player he is uh, now at GWS. Then there's Frampton, Tom Mitchell as well, you know, at the age of 29 last year. None of these were high profile trades, but, you know, they all played a pretty key role in getting Collingwood a premiership this year as well. So anyway, my only point there is just interesting to see a lot of the fringes moving around, uh, but it doesn't mean that it is not going to be pivotal for a potential finals or premiership push for a team next year. All right, so we'll crack into the actual updates. Uh, one of the somewhat more high profile trades of this uh, off season, Jade Gresham, uh, in terms of a free agency or a potential free agency move from St Kilda to Essendon. Uh, it's actually gone to the final day of free agency. So tomorrow is the final day where clubs can sign players as free agents. Everything from this point on will be uh, trades, be it picks or players. But we're up to the final day tomorrow uh, and uh, Essendon still haven't lodged a formal offer for Jade Gresham, which uh, it's, it's unclear exactly why. We do know that Essendon, you know, one of the biggest players this offseason in terms of getting four or five targets onto their list, have obviously had a lot to deal with. This could be a money thing. They could be looking at, you know, oh, Xavier Dersma hadn't actually requested a trade until a couple of days ago. Uh, maybe that wasn't a real possibility of getting him onto their list until, you know, Wednesday or whatever it was, Tuesday maybe. But now, with the prospect of Dersma joining the list becoming very, very real, perhaps Essendon's re-evaluating you know, what they can actually put in front of Jade Gresham in terms of a contract offer. Do other players need to make their way out? Either way, what we do know is that, uh, well, the deadline, deadline is tomorrow for a start, but St Kilda has also made it pretty clear that uh, similar to North Melbourne and Ben Mackay, St Kilda will be matching any offer that doesn't uh, generate them a, a first round draft pick. So not necessarily band one, which was uh, North Melbourne's, which would be about pick 12 or 13. I think uh, it sounds like band two would be acceptable to them. So that would be a pick, you know, in the early 20s at this point, which is fair. You wouldn't let Jade Gresham go for anything less than that. If anything, I'd probably be willing to pay a little bit more for that. I, I do quite rate him. But it does seem that Essendon really, really need this deal to go through as a free agency deal. So they don't need to give up any draft collateral. So they may just be working out, you know, all the intricacies of the contract to make sure it generates a big enough contract so that uh, the Saints do 
do get you know band two compensation as an absolute minimum because Essendon don't want this to go to a trade. They've got enough to deal with. They want this finalised tomorrow. So you know one of the quirky things about the system is you see players get overpaid as free agents so that it generates compensation so that it doesn't end in a trade negotiation where teams need to give up picks. You know Essendon obviously didn't want to go to a position where they had to trade for Ben Mackay. It's going to be the same thing with Gresham here. Uh, we saw uh, what happened a few years ago with Joe Danaher was an interesting case study in how the system can be gamed a little bit. And what we saw in that scenario was Brisbane offered a deal, uh, I think it was three years to Danaher that would specifically generate, uh, must have been band one or band two compensation, I can't remember exactly. They offered him that, uh, that short and fat contract and then as soon as they had signed him onto their list, they negotiated a longer deal which would spread it out. So a little bit of a quirky way of gaming the system, but there has been a suggestion Essen is going to do that this time as well. Finding the contract, get the Saints, uh, you know, band two compensation of where it is and then negotiate a longer and more drawn out contract for Gresham after the fact. So to summarize, I expect this deal gets done tomorrow and I expect the Saints to get exactly what they want and then Essendon can progress with their other deals. Uh, the other piece of news that uh, is mildly interesting, particularly to a Western Australian audience, is that uh, Fremantle have really thrown their hat in the ring for Tyler Brockman. So, you know, as of a, a week ago or even a few days ago before the Lockie Shules uh, news broke, uh, this was kind of, he had a one-way ticket to West Coast and it was pretty sewn up and that may still be the case. But we know that subsequently Consequently, Fremantle, with the very real prospect of losing Lockie Schultz, they now need a small forward and are going to make things a little bit awkward for Hawthorne and West Coast. And reportedly, reportedly, Fremantle have offered Tyler Brockman four years. That is insane. I think West Coast have offered three, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, the form of Tyler Brockman does not really justify three years. It probably justifies two on the open market. I, I would expect Hawthorne to have offered him two. Maybe Hawks fans know him better than me and say, no, it's, it's actually worth three, but four is pushing it. But anyway, this is an interesting one. Fremantle obviously throwing the hat in the ring, trying to entice him to uh, Fremantle over West Coast. For whatever reason, he is very, very uh, keen to get to West Coast. According to his manager as well, they're still going to go to West Coast. And it's just it's just interesting to me. I'm not really too sure why. I, I can only think of the Tim Kelly example where Tim Kelly was also adamant that he wanted to go to West Coast and not Fremantle. Uh, there was a suggestion that West Coast with an older list had um, a bit more of a culture around supporting parents. Uh, I don't really know if that applies here. The list is changing, but we still do have an older list. But for whatever reason, Brockman really wants to play for West Coast and not Fremantle. And you see it's an interesting scenario where there's always a, a strong preference of one over the other. And uh, it's funny as well, like the conversation around uh, players needing to go back to their home state for family reasons, they've always got to nominate a club. And there's a lot of criticism for that. Can I just say, not to sound like a salty Western Australian, but I feel like this conversation only ever bobs up when a player wants to come to Western Australia. It's not really like who's looking at uh, Lockie Schulz, who reportedly wants to go home for uh, family reasons or personal reasons, whatever the actual line was that he used. But nobody's really criticized the fact that he's only going to Collingwood. But anyway, Hawthorne, uh, obviously, I think sounds like they want to deal with Fremantle uh, because they are still keen on getting Liam Henry, which is another interesting one as well. Um, that one's delayed a little bit. I think St. Kilda are still working out what they've got in terms of compensation. I'd previously made the point that I think the Gresham compensation goes to Fremantle for Liam Henry. So that's probably why that deal slowed down. But Hawthorne still rate themselves a chance according to reports and therefore are um, keen to get Brockman to Fremantle. But we know it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the landscape of the AFL player movement scene is that the, the players will ultimately have the final say over where they go. So they'd need to convince Brockman. Previously, I'd sort of thought, you know, maybe the Hawks were holding out for getting Brockman as a part of a pick one deal, but I don't know if that's actually true. While we're on uh, the West Australian clubs, uh, there was a little bit of a rumor that bobbed up that I assumed it was actually a big footy rumor and I didn't take any notice of it, but uh, was actually reported in the West and uh, the, the article suggested that North Melbourne are interested in securing Jack Darling from the West Coast Eagles. So I'll quote the West. It says Jack Darling could be on the trade table as part of a deal with North Melbourne to split the coveted number one pick. According to discussions on AFL Trade Radio, North Melbourne has shown interest in the Eagles malign spearhead. So that is the entire depth of the article. I think this is a case of nothing to see here. Uh, I don't know to what extent it's true. They reference discussion on AFL Trade Radio. It hasn't really been reported any anywhere since it would be extremely out of character for the Eagles and Darling to uh, to want to see this move through and probably from a list point of view other than adding some experience to their forward line I don't see what's in it for North Melbourne so I thought I'd address it because it was formally reported on the west but I think this is a case of nothing to see here. 
Then you've got the Asada Radagalia deal uh, bubbling away under the surface. I knew this one would take a while um, because Geelong really, really don't want to deal Asava to Port Adelaide. Uh, but the, I guess an interesting update that I saw is that Geelong have asked for Oli Lord to be part of, the, of a potential deal. He's a 21-year-old key forward, debuted for the Power this year, played 13 games, kicked four goals in that qualifying final against the Brisbane Lions too. So Geelong, knowing that Port Adelaide can't really stump up the draft capital uh, required, at least in their eyes, to get this deal done, they've asked for a young key forward. Now, we know that Geelong really don't want to give up Asava Radagalia, and it's fair to rate him. Um, but, I mean, at the end of the day, like, it's, uh, I'm quoting Chris Scott here. He says, I've been really invested in Asava, and my preference is to keep him, so I don't see a deal getting done at all at the moment. So just bear in mind, that quote is from a little while back. It's not from today or whatever. But there is a certain irony here, because, you know, Asava didn't play the entire year in their best 22. Uh, he's out of contract. And Geelong have a repeated history of going after players from other clubs. So there seems to be this air of preciousness a little bit around this deal. It's like, oh, I'm not willing to deal a Sava Radigalia who's out of contract and wants to move clubs. What the hell? Look, I respect Geelong's culture. They don't like losing players and they will fight to keep the players that they want. Uh, and this could be posturing from Chris Scott to make this deal as painful as possible for Port Adelaide. And fair enough, there's something to that. But at the same time, though, like, get over it. You take so many players from other clubs, you know, which is part of the rules. But to reiterate, I do think there is an air of preciousness here on behalf of, well, I'm quoting Chris Scott, but Geelong about uh, the prospect of losing a player. It's just something they clearly don't need to deal with that often. And uh, this is going to be a painful case. But we do know that they rejected Port Adelaide's split pick. You know, they power split a future first for 23, which is probably even pushed back now. Wasn't good enough for Geelong. So, you know, maybe this gets done for 23, 24, whatever it is, and a future sweetener, perhaps. Not really too sure, but uh, Oli Lord could be part of that deal. And finally, to end the video, I will just rattle off a few deals that uh, we heard about and haven't heard about for a little while since. So that is uh, Tom Fullerton uh, to the Melbourne Footy Club. This one actually does look like it could get done tomorrow. According to Toomey, he reckons uh, within the next 24 hours and a third round pick um, with, with future or this year's will make its way to the Brisbane Lions. Uh, we've seen a stalemate on uh, Ivan Soldo. That one, we heard that Port were interested. It is now reported that Soldo's interested but Richmond unwilling to deal so I don't know if that one happens there's also a player in limbo completely in Jordan Sweet from the Western Bulldogs who is one of the first players to request a trade this trade period to Port Adelaide uh, Port Adelaide trying to get both is this a contingency if one doesn't work they'll get the other it's unclear but we'll, we'll wait and see on that one um, the McAdam deal is obviously held up but as I talked about yesterday this is probably wrapped up in the Harrison Petty deal where Adelaide really, really want to get Harrison Petty. Melbourne unlikely to blink. This one could be a drawn out and protracted one until Adelaide give up because I do think they'll eventually miss out on Harrison Petty. And another deal that's taken, uh, it feels like unnecessarily long, is Kaczynski to uh, Richmond from the Hawthorne Footy Club. I know the Hawks uh, asked for what is now pick 28 from Richmond. They might see that as a bit steep. That's fair enough. He probably he can't crack a regular game in that team. But for whatever reason, this deal's held up. But another one of those deals you'd expect to get done probably next week. But anyway, guys, that is the wrap of what is happening at the moment in the AFL trade period world. I'm hoping that something didn't just break in terms of a story while I was recording this, something like Real Juicy. But um, I will be back tomorrow. As I said, plenty of content going around to the channel at the moment. If you, by all means, go check out my previous tra uh, trade updates. Things do change fast, but a lot of it is still relevant. And I've got some ideas for um, some videos this weekend, probably looking at Fremantle's reten retention issues. And then, uh, you know, maybe a look at the Northern Academies and how they have impacted the AFL as well. So appreciate all your support. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you in the next video, guys. Cheers.